to be in John chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, now is a great time to pull that out. And uh, if you were here last week or you've been here, you would know exactly where we're going to be because we just are picking up where we left off last week. And if you want a Bible, you need a Bible to take home with you, please stop by the New Year area on your way out. We'd love to send you home with a Bible. And we've been giving away lots of Bibles lately, so that's awesome. So keep taking them. There's another really cool thing out there. You've probably seen it on the tables, these little booklets. Those are the entire Gospel of John. Now, the font is really small, but they squeezed it all into these really cool little booklets. And you can take not just one or two or three. I mean, take the whole table worth of books, like take the 10 of them, and then you can read them for yourself, and you can give them out to people. They're really cool little things. So John chapter 6 is where we're going to be today, starting in verse 16, this incredible account. Here's what John tells us happened. That evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon a, a gale swept down upon them and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed three to four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. And they were terrified, but they called out to them, don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. Help me announce the title of this message this morning. Say, it is closer than you think. Closer than you think. There you go. And if the person next to you is comfortable, put your faith, hand right in their face and say, it is closer than you think. It is closer than you think. And John is in the middle of this amazing account of Jesus' life. And he just told us one of like the most amazing miracles that ever happened where Jesus fed 5,000 people. It was amazing what happened, and it's recorded for us in all four Gospels. It's just absolutely miraculous. And today, he continues that with like another amazing miracle of Jesus walking on water. Again, incredible stuff. And John is picking these things out because it's happening during the Passover time. And John is always highlighting these signs and saying like, you Jewish people, you used to do this, and you this is how you know it worked, and this is what you believe, that this is like God fed the, the Israelites in the wilderness with this manna, and then here comes Jesus, and he's like, I was that manna, and I am the bread of life. Jesus is saying, I am the thing that you need. All this old stuff is old. It was just a picture of, of me. I'm the son of God. I've, I've come to basically say that me and my father have a special, unique relationship. And he's doing these amazing miracles to prove that what he said was actually true. And so next week we're going to dive into all that a whole lot more as, we, as he explains like this whole thing of what he's doing. And this, this idea of the Passover, this, this is when God called Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And they were, they were getting there, you know, Pharaoh and the army were behind them. And then they got up to the Red Sea. And they're stuck on the water. They can't get through. And so God does a miracle and he splits the Red Sea and the people walk through on dry ground. And so I think, and I don't know for sure, but I think John sees as Jesus is walking on the water, he doesn't need the sea to part to cross the water. Jesus is the Son of God. He just walks right on through. It's this amazing picture of this son of God. We're talking in this series, in this little series, this little section about breaking the rules. Jesus breaks the rules of nature. You can't feed like 20,000 plus people with five crackers and two sardines. It's impossible. You can't, unless you want to prove to me otherwise after the service, you can't walk on water. Jesus is breaking the rules. He's breaking the rules of nature because he's truly the son of God. And so as this text gets started today, it tells us that it was getting late, darkness was about to fall, and Jesus still hadn't come back. He went up and kind of got away from the crowds, because if, if you can feed 20,000 plus people, everybody wants you. 
and Jesus kind of snuck away, he was praying, maybe he was sleeping or resting, and he took a little while to get back, and so the disciples figured, all right, well, like, we just have to go to the other side, so we'll just get in the boat, we'll beat the storm, maybe that's coming or whatever, and we'll get on to the other side. But John is the masterful communicator here. He's putting all of this together in these true stories and ways that we just understand all of what's going on. And when John tells us that it's dark and that Jesus wasn't with them, that's like a, the making of bad things happen, right? It's dark, you're alone, bad news. And so today we're talking about this idea that it's closer than you think. It's closer than you think. You get in the boat, you go across the sea, but bad news, the storm is closer than you think. And welcome to Connect Us Church, where we make you happy and talk <laughs> positively. The storm is closer than you think. It's true. It's true for everyone. No matter who you are, it's a, this is an all skate. This is a this is an everyone included kind of thing. You're going to be just getting out of a storm, you're right in the middle of a storm, or very shortly, the storm is coming, it's closer than you think. And here's, here's a storm, what a storm is. A storm is a circumstance allowed by God to change our conduct, that's what we do, and our character, that's who we are. Because when life is good and comfortable, you don't do anything. You just go on with the flow, and that's fine. But when there's some problems to solve and some challenges to overcome, that's where God does his greatest growing, his greatest maturing, his greatest stretching, his greatest leading you in these hard, stormy moments. It's where God does his greatest work, but it's also where we feel the most stuck. Like we're trying hard and we're trying to get there, but we just can't get there you see here they disciples rode for three or four miles they didn't have that far to go but they were trying as hard as they possibly could to get through that storm and they just couldn't do it and there's something you in, know inside of us human nature I think but also just culturally that when the storms come our reaction is to try harder to paddle harder, to, to just keep going. And so like when we run into things like our know, relationships are struggling a little bit, we just try harder to make it all work. Or or when work is not going that great, we, we show up earlier and we work more hours and we just try harder. Or, or when our bodies are feeling not that great, like we try all sorts of things to like make them feel better and we try all, try this and we try harder and we try to eat right more and we try to work out more and we try and we try and we try, but that works for some people. They bounce back and it's great, they try. But oftentimes and sometimes trying leads to like the complete opposite, where now that you've created all sorts of new problems that you never had in the first place, you just went totally 180, but eventually Trying, trying harder only leads to being defeated and giving up. So the other gospel accounts tell us that Jesus walked on the water and showed up to these disciples in this boat that were trying really hard. He showed up at like 3 o'clock in the morning. And so if they left like right before it got dark. That's about nine hours of trying hard. Nine hours of fighting the storm and just getting kept blown back to the middle, not anywhere closer to your destination. They're just stuck. They're stuck. They can't get out. And, and that's how we feel in the middle of a storm, isn't it? There's nothing we can do to get out of it. No matter where we try, no matter where we look, it's just over and over again the same rut that we just can't get out. So I'm wondering, uh, what are some of the worst storms that you've been in? I was reminded of this bridge this week, and uh, anyone know where that bridge was, or is still there? Delaware. Yeah, south of Delaware, and I've driven over that bridge a number of times. <laughs> Seventeen miles of beautiful water, going over the bridge, 
going under the water, <laughs> through the tunnel, coming up on the other side. Has anyone been over that in a storm? <laughs> Man, that's got to be a little scary, don't you think? 17 miles. What if it was dark outside? And what if you were by yourself? That's called a nightmare right there. That's what that's called. Thankfully, I've you know, not in, stuck in a storm on this bridge uh, before. But I do have another storm story for you. <laughs> I was trying to think of maybe one of the ones that is hardest for us. We used to live in Ephrata, and uh, the main road that goes through Ephrata is 322, and it goes up to Lebanon County, up through the what we call mountains, but they're really like rolling hills with lots of trees, right? And so you know what I'm talking about. So we're going up through there, and we were up in Lebanon County, Alicia and I, for something, I forget what. And uh, we were driving back home <clears throat> in the middle of a crazy storm. And I just remember going through that wooded area and like branches were falling everywhere, just hitting the car everywhere. It was raining, we couldn't see anything. And uh, we were driving more on like the twigs and the branches and trying to avoid the large tree limbs that were on the road. We were driving on that more than like the road. That thing was covered with debris. And again, what made it worse is it's dark, it's raining so loud that I can't call Alicia who's driving in the car behind me. And so I'm by myself, she's by herself, I'm trying to navigate through these uh, terrible conditions and I'm hoping that she's doing the same in the back. Like that is terrifying, scary, scary. It's the storms of life that natural reaction leads to terror, to fear. The, the disciples were terrified. And these physical storms that we can think of, they're metaphors for the trials that we go through in this life, through the, the health issues, the, the surgery and recovery time, it's the relationship issues, the mental health issues, it's the addiction problem we can't overcome, the financial struggle that we've been in seemingly forever. The, the, there's trials of all sorts of things that life brings our way. And these storms make us feel afraid. Like the natural reaction is fear. We think, what if this doesn't work out? What if they don't like me? What if I can't get better? What if I get caught? What if I'll never be able to recover? That's fear, fear. But fear is not the end of faith. It's the doorway to faith. Amen. The fear is not the, the end. Even I know it feels hopeless. It's the doorway to faith. Because not only is the storm closer than you think, but God is closer than you think. Thank you, Lord. Because when you're in the middle of a storm, it feels like there is no way out. It feels like you're stuck. It feels like there's loss of all hope, and fear just paralyzes us. We can't make decisions, we can't move, we don't know what to do, it's just we're stuck. But we have to realize that fear and that feeling of no hope is not the end of a road that we have to like try to turn around and try to go the other direction to find God over there. When we feel afraid and we're at the end of the road and there's no hope, the answer is you go through the door of fear to find God right here on the other side. Fear is a doorway to faith. And so the disciples are afraid. They're on a boat in the dark, in the, in the storm. They can't get out. And Jesus shows up walking on the water and says, don't be afraid. I'm here. And God's presence in the middle of the storm is all you need to make it through. And some of you need to hear that this morning. Any, you need to hear that God is with you. Tell your neighbor, God is with you. God is with you. God is with you. Don't be afraid. And yeah, some of us are doubting. Some of us are hurting. Some of us feel far from him. But God is with you. He is always there with you. 
And here, the Greek word that's used, that Jesus uses to say, I am here, is just the simple phrase in the Greek that says, I am. I am. Which John uses, will use seven more times in his gospel, as a sign that Jesus was saying, I am, uh, I am God. Because when God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, and Moses was like, who are you? What is your name? What are you doing? You know, who am I talking to? God said, I am. That's all you need. I am. And so John will give us seven more. This is like the unofficial eighth one, where it's like, what do you need to make it through this storm? You just need me. You just need me to show up. I am all you need. I am enough. I, I am what you need in this moment, in the middle of the storm. My presence is enough. You know, there's something about fear in the middle of a storm that God uses to help us know his presence more powerfully, isn't there? Maybe some of you know that personally, or you've seen somebody go through a big storm in, your, in their life, and that they just talk about how God has met them most powerfully in their hardest place. Like God was there at their lowest place. Or when you feel like you are running from God or that God doesn't even exist or when you've made so many bad decisions and you've kind of forgotten about the Lord and you look around in your life and you there's nothing good anywhere, that's where God is. You're never too far from God. God is closer than you think. I wanted to tell you about this older guy that I knew uh, at my first church where I was a pastor at for a number of years. We got to know him for a while, um, and uh, it was just amazing to see, like, he was a, he was a great guy, a real, i say, maybe successful guy, a really strong guy in his faith. Uh, he was a stone worker, and he put together these most beautiful, amazing, like, stonework stuff. So, like, the church building is, like, built with the stones that he did himself with his, you know, bare hands, you know, that type of thing. He put together these beautiful fireplaces all over the region. I mean, just incredible stuff. And he loved God for a long, like, his whole life. He just absolutely loved the Lord. He would sing louder than anybody in that church. And he knew his Bible. He would just quote scripture and quote scripture. And so we'd go and visit and we, you know, what had a you know develop a good relationship over the years. And and eventually, and he has since passed away, the end of his life, it just, you know, his health was declining. And we went to go visit and we kept, you know, having those conversations. And and there was one visit that I will never forget. This, I mean, he wasn't doing good. He spent a lot of time in his chair. He couldn't move. He really couldn't get up that well. He lost a lot of his strength. I mean, you can imagine a big, big, strong guy that just lost every physical ability he had. And again, we get together, and I'm always looking forward to, man, he's got some songs for me. He's got some scripture for me. He's got so much encouragement for me. He just oozes out Jesus. And, and that day I came to visit him near the end of his life, I was like I said, I'll never forget. It was like... He was so excited to see me. And he looked at me and he's like, I'm so glad that you're here because I just had like the most amazing, incredible time with God yesterday. I'm like, what about the other 90 years of years of your life? He was like, I had, I don't know if it was like a vision or like a special kind of feeling, but he just went on to explain. He's like, I, like, I don't even know how to put this into words. But here's a guy that can't like really move, he can't really do anything, he's so, you know, he's near the end of his life, and he's like, I just tell you, I felt God put his arms around me like I've never experienced it before. And he just starts bawling, like, oh my, like, how, what does that even feel like? And what does that even mean? Like, here's a guy that loved God his whole life, and now he's at like the very end, and he's like, let me tell you, you don't know anything yet about it. And I, I, I don't understand what that feels like, but I, that story and his testimony just gives me such encouragement or peace that like when that's me in that moment and I lose all of my strength and abilities and things that I kind of trust in, you know, all that stuff, and I'm just stuck in a chair, 
that's when, I don't know, that's when God is going to reveal his love and his grace and his mercy to me the most. Like, I just know that. I believe. I don't know what that means. But like there's test, not just his testimony, but story after story of God showing up in our hardest, darkest, lowest moments. And one of the reasons that that is so powerful, and I think that it's true that God's presence is enough for us in the middle of our storms, is because God is above the storm. Like, he's not infected or impacted by the storm. He's outside of it all. He's in control of it. He's, he's above it all. And so when the other gospel writers talk about this story, Jesus got into the boat and the storm stopped. He's God. He's in control of nature. Even the wind and the waves obey him. And he's walking on the water. Right? He doesn't need a boat. He doesn't, he's not impacted by the storm. In fact, the other writers tell us that Jesus was just crossing to the other side of the lake. And it was like he was just walking. And he was going to keep walking to the other side because that's what he was doing until the disciples kind of saw him and thought he was a ghost and was like yelling out to him. And he, Jesus was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just walking across the lake. And he's just doing his thing. And the disciples kind of get a hold of him and he's like, all right, I guess I got I guess I gotta go over there and help him. They've been stranded for nine hours. You know, he's outside of it all. He's controlling it all. And so he goes over and Peter's like, is it you? And, and he's like, if it's you, like, let me come out. And so Peter's walking on water. And then he sinks and Jesus reaches down and grabs him and pulls him back up. And you little faith are you? <laughs> like, where's your faith at? Jesus is just, he's like, this isn't a big deal for him. He's not in impacted by the storm. He's just walking on by. But how is it possible that Jesus walked on water? How is it possible that Jesus could walk on water? It's not possible. Obviously, right? It's a miracle. It's a way for him to show his power over creation. Like, he created the water, so he gets to do whatever he wants to do with the water. But many people in our science, naturalistic, focused world have a real problem with miracles. And, and maybe you do too. You see a story like this of Jesus walking on water, and you're like, yeah, that's why I don't believe the Bible. That's ridiculous. Or, or you have friends, you have family that think that, you know, it's just like, that's not, that's like what they used to believe, like, all those years ago. We don't believe that anymore. Because it is. It's impossible to walk on water. But a miracle, by definition, is something that it's supernatural. Like, it's not natural. It, it's impossible to naturally happen. He's outside of nature, and he's intervening. It's supernatural. And we have to deal with this problem of miracles because the gospel writers give us 31 miracles of Jesus in their gospels. And they tell us, if we're going to follow Jesus, we got to accept and believe that this guy named Jesus, who we might trust in or, or believe was true or whatever, he did miracles, 31 of them, in fact. Six of them were exorcisms, 17 of them were healings, including raising three people from the dead, and eight nature miracles. And all of them were to not just put on a sideshow performance, but they were to explain who he was, to show that he is in fact God, that he was the son of God, that he is over even Satan with the exorcisms or, or with the healings, he's over the consequences of sin. And with nature, he's, he's over nature. Jesus is over nature. And you might say, okay, yeah, I know that's the Bible. I would expect the Bible to talk good about Jesus, to give him like all these powers and abilities that he's really the miracle worker and he's doing all these amazing things. Like, of course, that's in the Bible. Well, do you believe other ancient documents other than the Bible around the first century by historians? Do you believe those are true? Because there's one in particular, his name was Josephus. This is not in the Bible. 
that was a, lived around the time that Jesus lived that wrote about a guy named Jesus who was a, guess what? Miracle worker. So if you're not sure about the Bible, what are you going to do with Josephus' testimony that there was a guy and he did miracles? Something happened. Like, this guy wasn't just a normal guy. He did something. And so as we're just, we're going to get a little philosophical for a moment. As we're trying to wrap our brain around this idea of miracles and the, how they work or what they work or things that can't work or whatever, like, just think about how much our science has changed even in the last couple hundred years. Our understanding of the natural world. If they say, oh, this is impossible. Okay, well, our understanding of what's possible and not possible has greatly changed over even the last couple hundred years. So, like, for example, there was a time when, like, Newton's laws were, like, the only thing that existed. And then there was a guy named Einstein who came along and said, no, there's some relativity in this. So yeah, some of what you said is all right, but there's some other stuff that's like, it needs to change. You have to expand your uh, definitions here. And then, like they even talk today, and they're like, that's like the old science. Like they, that's the word, that's the old science. There's stuff now with quantum theory that you're trying to study random chance. How do you do, how do, you do that? Everything in old science was predictable, and you could look at it and measure it, but now they realize that our world has all sorts of random chance. And how do you how do you study that? How do you put that in a test tube and, and look at it? These are theoretical things that we have to like we have to understand, like things have changed over time. Or you say, this is observational science, I've never seen a miracle. I've never seen anybody walk on water. And have you seen somebody walk on water? So how do you know it's possible? You've never seen it, right? I can't see it. So we want to see stuff to prove it. So like, for example, this was a thing, a real thing. They would look at these swans back in the day, and they would say, by their observational science, all the swans in the world, if you were a swan, you were white. All the swans were white. Europe, that's what it was. All the swans were white. So here's the question for our observational science thinking people. We haven't seen any miracles. Okay, but how many white swans do you need to see to prove to yourself that all swans are white? How many? The one swan? Ten swans? A hundred swans? You got a whole sea of swans and they're all white. How many swans do you need to see? They're all white. So everybody was like, well, every single swan we've ever seen in our whole life is always white. Nothing else exists. It can't happen, it's impossible. Until explorers went to Australia and saw that. Okay, we have a black swan. <laughs> what do you do with that? You never observed it before, you never saw it before. It's impossible, it's outside of your defined definitions of what can happen, and here it is. Here it is. So if there's stories, and there are hundreds of thousands of stories all around the world throughout history, even in recent history, in every culture, every language, every religion, that talk about things that are unexplainable from the natural sense. Like even just, if you just talk to doctors, and you ask them, have you ever had a story of something happening that was unexplainable? You didn't have an explanation for it. Hundreds of thousands of stories like that. If only one of those stories was true. Like maybe that all the other ones had explanations and we just don't know. Them. But that one was truly an unexplainable event from naturalistic means. That's all it takes for miracles to be real things. Because miracles by definition are things that rarely happen. When somebody outside of nature comes in and intervenes and, and does something completely opposite, like that's what a miracle is, just because it doesn't happen every day doesn't mean it's not possible. It's the point of miracles that God is outside of the natural world and yet he intervenes. He's in control of everything and he stops the storm, he calms the storm, he's with us in the storms. And yes, storms are terrifying. You feel stuck? 
You try harder and harder to dig yourself out of the pit that you found yourself in. You get keep blown to the middle of the sea. You can't get to the shore. There's nothing you can do about it. And yet Jesus shows up in the middle of all of that and meets you right there. And he has the ability to stop all of it. And John tells us that, I love this, immediately they arrived at their destination. So not only is the storm closer than you think, and God is closer than you think. But come on, somebody. The shore is closer than you think. Amen. Amen. We got to praise God that the storm is almost over. Amen. The storm that you're in, the end of it is near. Now, I don't know how near. I'm not God, a miracle working God that's going to. You know, come in and do something miraculous in your life. I can't tell you exactly what that's going to look like. I'd be lying to you to tell you if that was true, right? But I want to inspire hope and belief inside of you that while we don't know when or, or if and all that stuff, that you got to believe that God can do it. Yeah. That he has the ability to end the storm whenever he wants to. Like right now, like in this moment, in this seat, he has the ability to end the storm. Right now. He can do it. Maybe you've been dealing with a storm for those nine hours, like the disciples just rowing, trying to fight that thing off. Or maybe it's been nine years that you've just been digging yourself a hole that you, it just keeps getting deeper. You can't get out. Or it's been 90 years of enduring a storm your entire life. My friends, the shore is closer than you think. The end is almost here. And, and I can say that a couple different reasons why, but one of them is sometimes, this is human nature, sometimes humans are so good at making stuff up in their head, these problems to be bigger than they actually really are. And so we get all bent out of shape and all like anxiety of worry about everything. And really the problem is like, oh, just take a step and you're on the shore. Like sometimes it's really that easy. Yeah. And, and I just, you know, I don't have to give an example, you know some examples, but I just was thinking like that time when your boss tells you, hey, tomorrow, you meet me in my office tomorrow and you're like okay and you go home and you tell everybody that man I guess I'm fired and you pack up your stuff sell your house <laughs> at that point right but then you cry yourself to sleep and you're, you're just like man I, I this is over I'm, I'm done with there's no hope here and in the middle of the fear and the anxiety you work up enough courage to actually go to the meeting you walk into the room and the boss hands you a card and says, thanks for working here. And you're like, that's it? Because you've made up so many crazy conclusions in your head to make the problem so much bigger than they actually are. I mean, come on, the shore is much closer than you think. Just take a step, you're there. But sometimes the problems, the storms are really as big as we think they are. Maybe bigger than we think they are. You know, there is that health diagnosis, and it is bad. And unless God does something miraculous, yeah, it's not going to work out for you here. You've got limited time. You've got days, months, years, whatever. And the time is coming to an end. But it's in those moments as believers in Jesus that we have to hold on to this beautiful reality that our last breath here is like the first one where we're really truly alive with our Savior in heaven forever. Like it's better. The shore is closer than we think. Amen. But until we get there one day, God is with us every step of the way and yeah the, the storm is closer than we think too right it just is the fact reality there's one right around the corner in your life if you're not in a storm right now it's coming it just is 
But never forget this, that Jesus is the one outside of the storm. He is our rescuer. He is our deliverer. He is our savior. And we need to trust him and rest in him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the one outside of everything that worries us, that you are the one outside of everything that pains us and hurts us, that you are in control, that you are above it all, that you have ultimate power and authority. And so, Jesus, we just rest in knowing that you're with us, that your presence with us is truly enough. And I pray today that you would just reveal yourself in a special way, whether it's that wrapping your arms around them or answering a prayer they've had for years or just showing them something more about you, Jesus, today than they've ever seen before in their life, that you would just speak directly to each single one of us and help us know that we can trust you and that you are Almighty, powerful God who walks on water. 